Welcome to this Mission Innovation Ministerial side event on tracking clean energy innovation progress, increasing the efficiencies of R&D policies through data and analysis. My name is Daniele Poponi. I am the co-lead of the tracking progress work stream of uh, Mission Innovation. And um, this panel is organized by the Mission Innovation Secretariat in collaboration with the European Commission Joint Research Center, the International Energy Agency and the International Renewable Energy Agency. So these uh, three institutions are all involved in different work strands of tracking progress within Mission Innovation. This panel is a, a fourth of a series of events that look at different aspects of tracking clean energy innovation progress. We had three workshops in April and May on uh, innovation impacts, patents, and R&D data collection, the recording of which are all available online. So the objective of today's event is uh, twofold. First, we want to take stock of the achievements of this work stream of mission innovation, the activities uh, of which started uh, roughly three years ago. And second, uh, we want also to inform the design and implementation of uh, the future activities of the so-called mission innovation insights module, which effectively will succeed the tracking progress work stream. So looking at the uh, broader picture, um, the aim of uh, all of these activities is mm, to contribute improving the effectiveness and efficiencies of clean energy innovation policies of mission innovation members. And since we believe uh, that new data and analysis, as well as coordination of efforts and international level, and a consolidated community of practice can contribute to this goal. Now, in terms of, of the structure of this panel, uh, after the welcome remarks from uh, Jenny Dotson, the head of the Mission Innovation Secretariat, we're going to have uh, uh, three presentations. Um, each will summarize progress on different work strands, such as tracking private R&D investments, enhancing public R&D data collection, and uh, tracking overall clean energy innovation progress. After the presentations, we will have uh, a short Q&A session and a break. Then the second part of the panel will be a round table, opened by a set in the scene presentation on the EMI Insights module. The roundtable will be moderated by uh, Statis Peteves. So uh, without further say, I'll just go for a few housekeeping items. Uh, please uh, mute your microphones and use the chat if you have any questions related to uh, presentations. Uh, no need to raise your hands. I would um, kindly ask presenters to look at the chat after their presentations and answer questions that are specifically addressed to them in the chat whenever that is possible. I will then address the more uh, general question to each presenter during the Q&A. So you will have the recording of this event available in the chat of this uh, uh, event and also on the on-demand section of the uh, SAM MI Ministerial website. So without further say, I'm going to introduce um, you the first speaker, Jenny Dodson, the head of the Mission Innovation Secretariat. Jenny will give us the welcome remarks. Over to you, Jenny. Thank you very much, Danielle, and I'm delighted to be here for this side event at the sixth Mission Innovation Ministerial, which marks a really important moment as we move from the first phase, the successes of the first phase, forward to the, the next uh, uh, phase in, in the initiative. So tracking progress is always a really central part of mission innovation's activity since we launched. As many people say, we don't know what we don't track, and this is more important than ever in the case of climate action um, and clean energy innovation. And I'm really and proud that mission innovation has really been instrumental in this space over the past five and five years. 
um, in helping to strengthen data, strengthen information and strengthen the clean energy innovation landscape. For instance, we published annually the country highlights, which brings together the only annual reporting from countries about their efforts in clean energy innovation, uh, from qualitative through to quantitative data. Really pleased that we've been partnering with the International Energy Agency on strengthening the information about RD&D investment. And we have new data over the past few years from a number of countries. We've been working with the European Commission's JRC to strengthen evidence around private sector investments and understand what's happening in that space. And working with IRENA to understand how we can strengthen the assessment of outcomes um, of innovation. But I think also more importantly, perhaps, is that we're strengthening the communities. So bringing together people who are experts in this space with policymakers who use this evidence and data, uh, with academics who are thinking it through how we can, how, what we can do in the future. And this is really essential to understand how we move forward in this area. And we know that there's a lot to improve on in areas where we don't have sufficient evidence currently. And also that evidence can change the conversation. It can change the focus of the investments uh, at the, uh, in clean energy and change the focus on where we need to invest and how we need to invest. Um, and all of the information we need at the pace we need it. And this is going to be a really important part um, of the next decade of action that needs to happen around clean energy innovation. This is a really critical decade uh, for, for climate change um, and for action on, on clean energy transitions. Um, for instance, I hope in the future that Mission Innovation will work with partners, um, current ones and new ones, to convene and facilitate stronger and better evidence that reaches policymakers and investor, investors on what investments are going and where they're going, on emerging hotspots of innovation progress, how costs are falling, and learn how to do innovation policy better. This will be essential for the vision of Mission Innovation 2.0. You have a fantastic set of presenters and speakers here today, so I wish you a really fantastic conversation and, and know that we will use this information and continue to have these conversations as we go forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jenny. I'm now passing the floor to Carlos Barria, the head of the Energy Policies and Studies Division at the Ministry of Energy in Chile. Carlos, uh, you are our host here. Welcome to this panel. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, eight years ago, I had the challenge of leading a team in the Ministry of Energy with a special deliver. The idea was to start a process to build the first CSP plant, a concentrated solar plant in the Atacama Desert in Chile. Uh, why this new technology? Because it can produce 24 hours with solar energy and storage with molten salt. Our team worked very hard to evaluate every detail and data of this innovative technology. The IDV worked with us to design a financing package to leverage the project and uh, to auction this package. We had to convince many people uh, who did not believe in CSP <laughs> for a lot of reasons. But last, last month, in April, the first CSP plan in Latin America had its first synchronization to the national electricity system. So the, the availability of data and good information as well as economic and technical assets is key for the effectiveness of public policy design and implementation. Decision making needs to be informed by reliable data. At the same time, understanding how public policies must evolve in order to meet the changing needs of a changing society is crucial, especially in the energy sector, because it's a key driver of economic growth, personal and social well being, and the main source of environmentally sound measures to foster a low carbon economy. Policy analysis helps us to understand how social, economic and political conditions could change under different scenarios. For example, carbon neutrality and how sensitive the economy would be to be required changes in behavior. Understanding the costs and benefits of a clean energy transition, including the dynamics of different sectors, the enabling environment 
an instrument to reach the desired goals has been a cross-cutting matter in the development of public policy in Chile, involving data, modeling of different scenarios, and a multi-stakeholder participation. This approach was followed, for instance, in the definition of our N in the sea and carbon neutrality goal uh, through a multi-stakeholder process involving public and private sector representatives and supported by a third party reviewer, uh, the COP25 Mitigation Scientific Committee with the best Chilean researchers of energy and climate change. Chile was able to commit to the bold action of reaching carbon neutrality by 2050 with an ambitious nationally determined contribution, the ENDC, for 2030, as a step in the process to produce 50% of our net emissions. Based on past and current modeling work, reliable economic and energy data, several measures conform now the package of to reach the net zero by mid-century, decarbonizing the energy matrix with renewable energy, uh, sustainable industry with energy efficiency, green hydrogen, e-mobility, e sustainable building, the phase out of coal fired power plants by 2040, and the increase in carbon capture, capture by our forest. A more bottom, bottom up approach with detailed actions plans by sector to cope with sectoral soon to be agreed carbon budgets, including progress indicator, is what follows in our journey to carbon neutrality. The use of sound data and policy analysis, all together with a broad participatory process, was also instrumental to prepare our green hydrogen strategy. Key data such as renewable energy potential to, to, to nest estimated green hydrogen production, electrolysis capacity needed to drop in production costs in the midterm and which sectors could evade greenhouse gas emissions with green hydrogen conform the basis for high level representatives and technical experts to better understand the role that hydrogen could play both for Chile and the rest of the world. Numbers were key to put hydrogen at the core in today's energy and economic forecast for Chile and to advance private sector investment in the field. In line with in line with the aforementioned, relying on sound data and robust policy breakdown is fundamental in the current update process of our energy policy and long-term energy planning, both accompanied by periodic discussions and experts gathering guided by clear participatory rules and scheduled roundtables. Long-term long energy planning scenarios and specific energy measures are proposed and evaluated during this process. And again, numbers are essential to craft what our energy future would or should look like. This is not only useful for public policy making, but for private investment decision. In a separate work, a stream but closely related to the process described before, there is a strong need to understand how different economic instruments, including tax exceptions and carbon pricing, could operate and ease the energy transition in Chile. Baked by a thorough analysis of diverse combinations of current and future economic instruments, including their impact on GDP, emissions reduction, and distributional impacts, a high-level group will assist our government in proposing, in proposing a set of recommendations and roadmap for the implementation of selected economic instrument scenarios. Above all, not only reliable data and through technical and economic analysis is required, proper indicators and a revision timeline to track progress and consider uh, changes is essential to implement effective public policy. Chile is in the process of an energy transition and we will need data and information not only to R&D, and access new technologies that, that will allow us to achieve carbon neutrality, but also to achieve social and strategic agreements to design good public policies. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carlos. It is now time for the first presentation. Aliki Gergagaki from uh, the European Commission Joint Research Center 
will present on tracking private R&D investment in clean energy. Aliki is also the co-lead of the Tracking Progress Workstream of Mission Innovation. Aliki, the floor is yours. Thank you, Daniela. Um, a good day from uh, me as well. And just to confirm that you can hear me and you can also see the presentation now. Yes. OK, thank you very much. Um, uh, as Daniela said, our team has been involved in MI tracking progress and more specifically with the private R&D investment um, tracking um, in clean energy. And I would like to share with you today a few of the insights um, of this work. Um, why uh, the need and challenge to monitor private R&D investments, uh, the approaches and sources of information we have mapped on how to do so, how does the evidence we have found compare, what does the available data show us so far, other insights we've come across from our conversations in my tracking progress workshops with stakeholders, and how do we take all these considerations forward um, on what to do next for the future work in MI. So um, to put it uh, very simply, the private sector is by far the largest investor and has a key role to play in low carbon energy R&D. Um, we estimate that two thirds of all R&D investment is contributed by the private sector and up to three quarters more or less um, for low carbon R&D investment. The picture you see here on the right is for what we monitor in the EU, but uh, we also see a um, similar picture um, across uh, the board globally. So it is very important to track what the private sector does in terms of R&D, how much they invest and where is this directed in order to have um, well-designed supportive policies, filling in the gaps and pushing the development of the technologies forward. Um, so um, how do we do this and why is it so challenging, um, as I've mentioned before? So you can find um, information about the pri what the private sector um, invests in terms of R&D and their company statements published by uh, the big um, companies. Um, national statistical surveys also address this topic, um, but not, not all. There is fragmented pieces of news in terms of interesting companies to invest in uh, new technologies and perhaps also sometimes how much. And there's expert estimates and analytical approaches that try to bridge the gap and bring us some more information forward. However, why is this also challenging? Yes, there are uh, company statements out there about their R&D investments, but not all companies have to report. And when they do so, because of confidentiality and competition, this is done in an aggregated way. Multinationals will perhaps disclose how much they spend on R&D in-house, but uh, at the parent level, not what all the subsidiaries do. And of course, they work on a lot of technologies in different areas. Uh, so it's very difficult to decipher where this money goes to in terms of R&D development. Um, level of data aggregation is also due to confidentiality, um, a problem when we have disclosed information from national statistical surveys. And of course, um, the varying technology definition in what actually is, for example, under the clean energy basket or what uh, goes under each technology could um, hinder our efforts. There is also multiple ways to fund um, R&I activities. And here, mostly when we look at company statements, we look at in-house R&D, but that's not on the only way money is uh, channeled into this. Um, finally, the, the, the major issue here, there is no reference or baseline for comparison. We're in the area of estimates, but we have no way of knowing how good or bad these are um, at, at the end of the day. So um, touching on some of the things that, that I've mentioned before, the national surveys, um, there are a number of countries that have included uh, this sort of information in the questionnaires about R&D, so addressing the, the private sector. Um, you can see a few of my members here that have this sort of um, information included in their surveys. Most addressed uh, the area of energy uh, as, as a broad area, not clean energy, although some have very good underlying questionnaires that could give information for technology or for clean the clean energy uh, sector. 
Um, however, how much of this can be disclosed and at which level can be um, limited, as I already said. And this is again to the to the discretion of the companies how they feel in the questionnaires, and they also have the option to somehow um, allocate in different areas and sectors that uh, can cause um, problems when we try to interpret the surveys. These are also insights that came out from uh, the workshops we had with stakeholders on this. Basically, the existing classifications and surveys are difficult to use to get the information that we need, um, and they have to be very um, carefully designed uh, and interpreted. Uh, however, changing them too often causes additional burden to the companies, and that should be avoided. And we also um, heard that the response rates to this improve with the element of trust on who carries out the survey and why, rather than any legal obligation on financial incentive. These are interesting insights as we hear that more and more countries want to monitor private R&D and improve how they do this uh, through surveys. Now, the analytical methods that are another way of getting this sort of picture of private R&D um, are things are, are methods that um, are applied among others by ourselves, uh, the IEA or the you know, BNEF um, uh, study um, is one other source. And they can be data and resource intensive. We all start again from looking at the company um, statements of, of what the big companies stand on R&D. And they try, we try to break down what is disclosed in these financial reports using a, a proxy or an estimate based either on their business activity, their business, business lines, line. or um, patenting trends as a proxy. I'm getting some feedback. So if somebody has their mic on, please switch it off. Thank you. So um, the uh, these um, estimates can be based on uh, different um, definitions, again, on what a clean uh, energy might entail. And also we have to make uh, other background assumptions, as I mentioned, which uh, leads to the numbers that we all come up with being slightly different. Um, but if we look at this and try to put them into context, we can sort of more or less explain why that different is. Difference is this is here um, the outcome of some work we did for MI beyond 2020. Um, and at the time uh, we looked at the estimates um, available and from ourselves, the IEA and um, unit BNEF. So if you look here on the right hand side for 2018, the two light colored estimates um, and the one very dark one are all um, based on breaking down, as I said, the financial statement of companies using expert judgment or their business lines and business activities. Um, you can see that the IA and our own GRC estimates converge. Uh, the BNEF one is um, lower, but looking closer, what they put into the scope of this clean energy is much narrower. So that also explains the lower estimate. Finally, what we've included here is um, another way of estimating which we use, which uses patents as a proxy. Um, this is the second uh, darkest um, column on the graph, and that usually returns a much higher estimate. But this is also to be expected because what we are trying to do here is to extend this um, estimate from the previous three methods that use two or three thousand uh, main major companies and include the whole um, spectrum of the companies that we know are at active in patenting in clean energy technologies. Um, so this is also something to be expected. Um, and what we see in the end is we have a, a ballpark of 45 to 60 uh, billion euro at the time. Globally, we expect that to have gone up for 2019, but to come under pressure for 2020. So what does all this tell us on, on, on what we can and cannot say for private R&D in clean energy technology? Again, a drawing also from our consultation with experts and in the context of MI workshops. Well, monitoring private R&D investments is challenging, which we knew already, but what we can see is that we have estimates and figures out there, which we cannot necessarily consolidate and come to one true figure, but we, it's very interesting to keep monitoring the trends also for policy support. However, also the uh, financial and business reports do not disclose the real picture or all the picture in terms of financing R&D from the private sector. 
Um, so there's other uh, ways of, of uh, mon money being channeled there from the private sector. And the question is, where should we focus future efforts? Uh, do we want to go for more accuracy? Do we want to look at um, the technologies uh, in depth, other types of financing, what is important? This is a question that I will leave for the panel later. Um, I would thank you for your attention for the time being. More um, information on our work is included in the digital library that the hosts have very kindly set up for us. Um, and I think it's back to you, Daniela, for the rest of the presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Aliki. The second presentation is uh, from two colleagues of the International Energy Agency, Roberta Quadrelli and uh, Simon Bennett. Uh, we, we will present on public our D and D data, building new insights from, from tracking progress. Roberta is the head of the section um, in the IA Energy Data Center, looking among other things at our D and D. Simon leads the IEA work on energy innovation uh, for clean energy transition. Welcome, uh, Roberta and Simon, uh, you have the floor now. Thank you, Daniele, and uh, many thanks for inviting the IEA to present uh, the latest updates on this work stream, public energy RDND data. Um, you already nicely explained how together with Simon we represent really different IEA perspectives on innovation from data to technology and policy. So uh, why are we here? Um, well, actually, we do clearly share a common priority. Um, IEA has a long-standing experience in collecting information on our D and investment across all energy technologies. Our members, we know, uh, value this data as a tool to set priorities, to verify the funding allocation, support uh, to various technologies, and equally, tracking has been fundamental for MI since its launch. So, with tracking progress here, we have developed the most appropriate data system um, to inform policy on clean energy innovation, and we have uh, an opportunity now to improve this work stream as a part uh, of MI 2.0. Um, IEA is happy to lead this work stream. In phase one, uh, the initial idea was really to enhance existing capabilities. And we are very pleased of the work with the EMI Secretariat to align processes, not only the reporting frameworks, but also the validation processes more recently, because uh, this has a clear immediate benefit for all uh, members through reduction of the reporting burden. And at the same time, is also helping us to enhance data robustness globally, you know, for all users, governments and beyond. Another point here is really by unifying these processes, uh, we could really have different constituencies, MI and IEA members, to talk to each other and exchange both on data but also on expertise. And this is a point we would like really to expand further in the process. And I have some more words about uh, the objective of developing and strengthening a real community of people around the RDND data, both to enhance a dialogue between data users and data producers, because this is really allowing to produce the best fit data, but also to really share the technical expertise and experience across different countries, because the real knowledge is really at the national level where experts are working with the data and collecting and compiling. Um, IEA has also developed in recent year a strong commitment to focus on data capacity, thanks to our opening the door policy. And one example was the work with Brazil for the establishment of their new system. But I would say in general, for all the members, even when uh, um, consolidated data collection is being redesigned, there is a strong value in having a dialogue uh, with counterparts uh, across the world. And we had these examples as well. Um, I think uh, the value of this uh, work as a platform um, is obvious if we uh, look at the success of last week workshop, uh, several um, people were, uh, that are here today were there. We had one in Malmo at the Ministerial in 2018, but last week, because of this virtual opportunity, we gathered around uh, 100 experts for a few hours <laughs> to discuss together 
all these uh, technical matters and the shared experience, and it was quite engaging. And I think it's a very um, strong reward also for the IEA to see that. Uh, so actually, I would like to thank all the participants, uh, some are here as well, and, and the team, um, because it was a very intense work for everybody here, for the full innovation team at the IEA and the colleagues from MI. Um, I'm just sharing an example here to show the typical um, interaction we can have in, in a meeting of, of that type. This was a, an online question, but on challenges that are faced during data collection. And uh, we can see that different uh, experts share common challenges. In this case, it was um, ranging from the coordination of different funding institutions to really something more technical, like definitions of boundaries or classification on technologies in different uh, categories, et cetera. But the point is really we have common challenges and we need to develop common solutions to really leapfrog as someone uh, was actually mentioning. So not to repeat the problems of uh, that other experts uh, had. So um, it was uh, the idea really to, to that, be, that data collection is evolving also through the building of this community um, and we can improve data also through this constant dialogue with our data providers and this is a typical way of proceeding for the IA. And so I take also the chance to show you the sort of output from our data collection. We had a recent release of public r and &D investment data. Thanks to all our providers, uh, these estimates uh, um, are up to the year 2020. And as usual, we do um, actually have a next update in a few months in October to ensure that we provide always the most uh, timely um, information for all our users. Uh, taking the chance also of, of reminding that the first time we got Brazil data and Lithuania data in this, in this uh, um, release. Um, of course, moving beyond members, this is our objective, beyond IA members, we want to compile the best global information and progressively improve the quality through this collaboration. So I would like to then invite uh, Simon to comment uh, from now on and provide the, the strategic remarks. Thank you, Roberta. And, um, Thanks, thanks for passing the floor. Thank you to the to the organizers, Daniele and others, for giving us the opportunity to to reflect. It's a great opportunity to to think a little bit about where we were in uh, you know back in 2015, 16, and where things stand today. Um, and so this chart shows, you know, in a sense, one of the things that Mission Innovation has made possible for us, which is to make our uh, our presentation of the the r d budget for energy around the world much more global uh, we've been able to add into this data set uh, members that are members of mission innovation in addition to to iea members um, from the the reporting uh, that's been part of the mission innovation process but i think also just as importantly from the connections that mission innovation has provided in this uh, global kind of data community now which is really on evidence at our workshop last week and so we're able to say that our estimate for 2020 is a, um, a slight increase in, in the global energy rd and budget this is not just low carbon or clean energy this is the whole lot and we think it's up around two uh, percent but we'll have much more clarity on that when we come to our our october uh, update because we still have a couple of data points waiting to be to be finalized roberto if you could go on to the on to the next slide what we've done in this this last couple of slides that um i'll you know, try and present within our slot is just reflect a little bit just as aliki did for the the private um data work on what are some of the lessons from this sort of you know five year first phase what have we what have we learned and when i was starting to think about this i realized that actually we do know you know in some senses a lot more um, and in some senses we've changed our our way of thinking about who some of the uh, the users of this data are and uh, what some of the important factors are. So I'll just quickly run through this list that, that came to our minds. Uh, the first is that it, there's no doubt that the appetite for data in this area is, 
is rising. And this is something that Jenny said at the beginning of the meeting. Um, the governments really are turning to to try to data to try and make evidence based policy in terms of R and D um, priorities, but also using the data to be able to make you know messages that are you know, politically resonant uh, about how they can raise spending and make it more consistent with some of the the ambitious pledges that are being made uh, for for example for net zero emissions uh, and you know being able to see this from a more global perspective uh, with the inclusion of uh, of china of india of, of, of brazil uh, i think has, has shown us the appetite in in those countries as well at the workshop last week we actually um, did one of these menti questions roberta showed one of them but another one we asked was about the uses of the data uh, and there was a fairly clear consensus that you know, benchmarking and tracking are two of the top uses of this data. I think we knew a, a fair amount about that five years ago, um, but evaluation has come up much more strongly these days as a use of um, of data. And for that, detailed data sets and compar comparability uh, between data sets are, uh, are ever more important for people to understand what has been the impact of, of policies and the impact of, of funding. Another key lesson um is that we haven't you know i think we've learned that it's not necessary to wait until we have all of the data uh, and it's all in perfect shape before we can get value from it um, and roberta mentioned brazil roberta mentioned lithuania and it's just great to see new countries entering the community and starting to get you know you know sometimes it's highly aggregated data it's not as detailed as other countries but it puts them on a pathway towards uh, towards improvement uh, and learning from others and sometimes we've also seen that some of the countries that are in the process of developing their systems uh, are really doing a, a job that you know can teach lessons to people who've been doing it for much longer um, another aspect that I came across for me at, at least so strongly in the workshop last week was just how much dedication and effort some of these data collection um, processes take at a national level. We heard from countries like Canada and Switzerland about processes that, you know, they start almost before the, previ the previous year's data was finalized um, in terms of putting in place methodologies. But the methodologies are clear, they are systematic, and uh, you know, it's very impressive, in fact, you know, that they take as long as they do, but they require as, as little personnel as they do to manage them. Um, so we're just tremendously grateful to all of the unsung heroes that are providing all of this data. And we think there's a lot of opportunities to just raise the awareness of what data is available and the hard work that is going into this. I think we owe these uh, these people um, to bring their, their data to the world uh, in some cases. Roberta, maybe we can just go to quickly to, to the last slide where, you know, just, just as Aliki did in, in her presentation, we haven't sought to answer the question of what the, the MI Insights module should aim to do, uh, but raise a, a few questions that might be considered in the in the panel discussion today. And this is just focusing on the, the public R&D data in particular. Um, but I think we, we've learned in recent years, you know, and I was actually going back and looking at some of my notes from meetings that we had on this topic, um, in the MI community back in 2017, 18. And I think we've learned something different about the, the users of this data. And so I've seen people using data that are much closer to the, the center of energy policy uh, decision making than just in the, um, the R&D funding uh, departments. And what format these people need the data in, I think is uh, is going to be key to, to the success. Um, there are different ways to go about this, and we've we've tried different things in our own website and uh, tried to make as much of the data uh, downloadable and, and transparently available with a lot of methodological information associated uh, with it. So we've got some things that I think we can we can share going forward. Um, and then certainly through the workshop we held last week, we were reminded that there is a value not just to putting the data out there, but also helping the community to improve the data. So data practitioners and how uh, their needs uh, can be balanced in terms of exchanges of, of best practices. Uh, the other um, question I think that is, is presented here is to what extent in, this is a process where there's a gathering of data to be uh, you know, to be owned and to be verified by uh, by MI, uh, and to what extent the 
the Insights platform kind of exists as an aggregator of lots of different data sources. And this is very much in the line of you know, things we've seen, for example, the, the European Union's uh, competitiveness report of taking lots of different data that sheds different, you know, sheds light on different elements of the innovation tracking problem, um, but makes it all available in the same place, even if it's not all kind of gathered and owned by the same entity, uh, but, you know, also describes the references and the limits of that data. Uh, there's there's some things to be considered around that. Um, and I think a key one that you know, we, we've also mentioned here is just that there is a, an appetite for this data to not be abstracted and aggregated, but also be presented in terms of the the projects that it's funding and the the progress that it is uh, that it is leading to. And how do we do that through the insights module in a way that the um, the journalists and uh, the the analysts that are accessing it uh, can take away the stories behind it. Um, and I think that's something that we can we can build on from the foundation we've developed in the first phase. And then finally, having a system that you know has what you might call constant improvement built in to this, uh, so that we encourage you know countries to to begin the process of data collection as we've seen through the first phase of MI. Um, but also be rewarded for making progress and for constantly improving the, the detail and the scope of this. Um, at the IEA, we've now started just this year making available any data that countries provide to us on their private sector investments um, and splitting out in demonstration funding from our research funding and state owned enterprise funding from the others. And we don't have that for all countries. But by making it all available, um, we're hoping to to incentivize countries to, to constantly improve. And we have processes with our data where we also um, publish scorecards and share them with the um, with the national kind of gatherers of data so that they can compare their performance. And there's there's ideas like that that we might wish to build into the to the insights module. But that's all that we we wanted to kind of raise at the end of this presentation. Thank you all for, for your attention. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Roberta. Our third presentation is from Martina Lyons, Associate Program Officer at the International Renewable Energy Agency, which will present on tracking clean energy innovation impacts. Martina, welcome. You are the speaker now. Thank you, Daniela, for the introduction, and I'm waiting for my uh, presentation to we upload it. Uh, it takes little time. In the meantime, I just want to thank the previous speaker from Aliki from GRC and uh, Roberta and uh, Simon from IA for their presentations on uh, RDND inputs and for setting the scenes uh, very nicely in terms of highlighting the importance of uh, tracking innovation inputs and the challenges uh, associated with it. Um, just to ask, can you see the presentation now? Yes. Great. Yes. So. Um, so it is my pleasure to be here uh, with you today and talk you through how IRENA is engaging and contributing to the work of Mission Innovation Tracking Progress Workstream. We started much later than the previous speaker, so we, uh, we are still learning about uh, what we are doing. Uh, but as Aliki, and uh, just to say that we heard from Aliki, Roberta and uh, Simon um, how a lot of focus is being put on uh, data gathering on inputs into innovation process and this has generated uh, very useful uh, insights but there is there has been substantially less activity trying to to define meaningful metrics to track the innovation outputs and outcomes and it's actually pretty tricky to to understand and track these outcomes and outcomes and outputs uh, we have been convinced uh, that we are having impact uh, with the work under uh, rdnd programs and funding which is being further incentivized uh, by mission innovation, but exactly what these impacts are and where are the strengths uh, and weaknesses is much harder to assess. And this is what IRENA is now trying to explore with two projects with a kind uh, support from the European Commission and the UK government. So these both projects are closely interlinked. The TAFE project um, is about broadening and deepening uh, some of the existing IRENA data sets, and uh, we are trying to provide greater granularity and, gre and so get greater insights uh, from that. So for costs and performance uh, indicators, this built on IRENA existing databases, which has more than 18,000 projects and 11,000 auctions. 
And uh, we're also expanding on patent and standards, building on IRENA inspired database. For the scope, we are covering uh, 42 countries, uh, all MI countries and uh, EU 27, and data has been gathered so far for 10 year period between 2010 and 2019, with some exception going a little uh, more, in, uh, more in the past. And uh, we are looking at six uh, technologies, onshore and offshore wind, solar PV, CSP, behind the meter batteries and uh, electrolyzers. And we are taking one of those technologies, offshore wind, to test the approach. And this is where the second project, Innovation Impact Dashboard, comes into. Because it looks at much ra uh, larger range of metrics together with the TAFE indicators. We identify over 50 indicators that might be relevant to clean energy technology uh, in innovation. The pilot project is now finished uh, recently, uh, a month ago, and uh, today I will be sharing with you some insights from that work and uh, what are we going to try to do next, or at least some of it. And uh, for the report, just please visit next week the, the publication website where there will be the report with full details and also a dashboard. Um, uh, I don't want to dive too much into the slides uh, for the sake of time, but because all the details uh, and all the caveats are in our analysis, in our report, but just to emphasize, this pilot is not trying to present the state of art uh, of the of the offshore wind technology and industry to critique it, but rather offers an approach to measure and understand the progress in the offshore wind technology and what it means for RD in uh, to inform policymakers. I feel someone took control of my slide, so. Uh, Anyway, so here is just a quick overview of all those 50 plus indicators I mentioned. Some are generic, applicable to multiple clean energy technologies, and some are specific, uh, mostly to perform on uh, performance uh, indicators. Uh, we eventually managed to collect 30 indicators for this pilot. We categorized them uh, under seven subcategories and three ca impact categories, the innovation the ecosystem, technology progress and market formation. And the indicators are categorized based on their contribution to the policy and strategic objectives. And the order of uh, categories then follows the innovation life cycle. And I will quickly walk you through um, uh, what we have learned. So I start with you know, progress in innovation ecosystem. This is just a quick snapshot from our dashboard, uh, which accompanies the, the, the main report. We, are look, we were looking at eight indicators for innovation ecosystem categories, scientific publication, various patents indicators, and RDND collaboration, which we consider a core output of the RDND activities. And we also look at international uh, conferences and events, which focus specifically on offshore wind, which are less direct indicator but we um, but are but are included or is included in this indicator and it offers some insights into how the innovation ecosystem is changing and we focus on trends and the geographical uh, distribution of uh, mission innovation and eu countries across these indicators and here are just some key insights uh, for the number of publication on how much Chinese publication grew and so on. All in all, uh, we saw a healthy innovation ecosystem that allows innovation and, uh, to develop and uh, be adopted. It is enabled by public and private innovation support mechanism and such a healthy uh, innovation ecosystem is also an essential precondition for stimulating further um, innovation. Uh, Okay, and now I lost the right to to go through the slide. So if I can ask someone to go to another. Okay, so progress in um, innovation. No, that's wrong here. Progress in uh, technology. Here we look at uh, 14 indicators across three um, categories. Again, the snapshot into our dashboard, we cover different costs, technology performance and project uh, characteristics. Uh, here are some example of installed cost, levelized cost of electricity, capacity factors and some um, rotor diameter or hub height and other project uh, characteristics. And this slide, just a couple of key insights into this category, into decrease of, of cost, whether it was installed cost or levelized cost of electricity, increase in capacity factors and, and other um, uh, other uh, quantitative um, measures or changes in the uh, 
in the project uh, characteristic and performance. All in all, we observe both breakthrough and incremental intonation and uh, the decline in costing metrics and increase in capacity factors and also other metrics, uh, which we saw that it can be contributed to the combination of learning by RDND, learning by doing and economies uh, of scale. However, the relative scale is much harder to calculate, but we saw the RDND activities in part bringing a diversity of projects from diversity in foundation ability to go further from offshore, uh, from the shore into deeper water, or the ability to tap higher wind uh, speed and greater at greater heights and generate more power using larger rotor diameters. And it is important to here emphasize that RDND activities need to continue to ensure much broader global uh, deployment. Um, the last category market formation, again here a snapshot from our dashboard. Um, we analyzed eight indicators, we mapped technology deployment and technology commercialization. Um, and here just a couple of key insights. Uh, what we learned from our analysis, we saw really huge growth, nine time um, Ninefold growth uh, in installed capacity in the time frame, also increase in uh, countries developing standards or number of standards going from zero to nine and so on. And uh, all in all, we saw market rapidly growing and moving towards a maturity, even if these deployment metrics uh, belong to the final steps of innovation chain, they're crucially linked to learning. Uh, by RDND, learning by doing, and economies uh, of scale. And just to summarize all those uh, categories, uh, we saw significant progress between 2010 and 2019 in multiple aspects uh, along the innovation chain, including rapid cost reduction, technology advancements, and breakthroughs, uh, scaled up deployment, new markets, uh, together with other aspects forming the enabling market. And all these has increased confidence in the market, which then unlock further investments. But despite all the progress made, the sector needs to continue to innovate, collaborate and harmonize to broaden the use and also to harness wind potential in deeper water and to further reduce costs. And again, for further detail, just uh, just uh, go to our website within a week to, to download the the, the whole analysis and look on the on the dashboard and here just quickly about the next step. So these were uh, just our initial findings, what we have been doing until now. Um, this is only the start and the work just basically kind of started and will be continuing to build upon what we have learned uh, through this pilot uh, study. We will be continuing refining this approach as part of the TAFE project. Uh, we will be exploring uh, read across to other technologies, refining indicators and methodology, trying to develop even more nuanced insights. And in particular, we have started looking into linkages between indicators and uh, innovation support and observed uh, impact. And just last two slides, um, just to show also what else we are doing. Um, so this slide, so Irina is uh, developing um, an inspired database, which I mentioned, which we are trying to um, uh, yeah, improve and, and include more data. We are trying to look on data on an annual basis and we are looking at filing data for all uh, different renewable uh, energy technologies. And we are looking at ups and downs in uh, filing uh, data. And this is where it all gets uh, very interesting because we are trying to understand the drivers uh, behind the, the changes and the, the trend. And here, here we see the peak in 2011, then a decline and then another peak close to 2016. And the question is, why is it happening. So is this causation a question which is pretty tricky and uh, uh, we, we saw there are different explanations. For example, the market, the, uh, if, if the market or the technology is advancing towards maturity, more mature technology and more mature the technology gets, less patents are filed or less investment, less patents are filed. But there are also other um, other factors such as uh, different policies at different level or economic situation, changes in priority and so on. And so there is not just one answer, but it's a combination of more. Um, and what we have started to what we have started to do at Irina, we started to also look on another another factor, which is 
uh, which are carbon markets. Um, and we saw that in 2001 at COP7, uh, uh, the, the first global carbon market CDM uh, was operationalized by um, Marrakesh Accord. Then it was followed in 2005 by the uh, EU uh, emission trading scheme, which both create, which created the first demand for carbon uh, credit. And uh, both of them kind of push for innovation or is expecting that they will push for innovation in renewable. But then in 2015, um, uh, in the uh, Copenhagen uh, was uh, COP15 at, in Copenhagen was considered as a failure for climate negotiation and also uh, carbon mar markets. And there is some expectation. There was some expectation that the interest in innovation will decline a little bit. Um, uh, so. Yeah, so this is what we what we have been learning. Of course, this kind of analysis needs much, much needs to be supported by more uh, factors. But just to give you an idea what kind of instruments uh, are having an impact and incentivizing innovation and what we are looking at. And last quick, quick uh, slide. Uh, just uh, the current work, ongoing work. Uh, so we are looking into enabling uh, technologies because the the electricity market is, is is maturing. The generation technologies are becoming very competitive and widely uh, deployed. So now we are looking into how this innovation can be integrated or how innovation can integrate uh, renewables into the system. So and this can be held by enabling technologies. And where he can uh, uh, see um, an increasing trend. Um, we see the peak in 2012, then the decline is not that steep and is flattened in the following years. And we started looking at electromobility, batteries, fuel cells, smart grids and uh, green hydrogen. So this is just to quickly, um, really rushly uh, outline what we have been uh, doing uh, in the last couple of months and uh, what we are currently working as, and contributing to uh, mission innovation tracking uh, progress. Thank you very much. And if you have any uh, question, you can uh, contact us on the email address there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martina. Now, for the sake of time, we will move directly to the second part of uh, this panel. Uh, I'm now going to give the floor to my colleague, <clears throat> Ingrida muraske bull of the EC Joint Research Center, <clears throat> which will moderate the second part of this event. If you have any question, please use the chat. Uh, Ingrid, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Daniela. Um, as we move now to the second part of the event, it is my pleasure to welcome Helen Fairclough from the Mission Innovation Secretariat, uh, and she will set the scene for us um, on the Mission Innovation Platform. So, Helen, over to you. Thank you very much, Ingrid, and thank you very much to all the speakers so far. It's been a fascinating insight into the work that's been done in the Tracking Progress work stream. Um, you've heard about the wide range of activity that's taken place in conjunction with our collaborating organisations in that work stream in the first phase of mission innovation. And we can now look forward to the second phase, uh, knowing that we've got some excellent foundations to build upon. The second phase of Mission Innovation, MI 2.0, has been co-designed with members and stakeholders over the past 18 months in preparation for launch this week. The goal of Mission Innovation remains to reinvigorate and accelerate public and private global clean energy innovation with the objective to make clean energy affordable, attractive and accessible for all. As Jenny said at the start, there's a lot we can do to contribute to this decade of action. Um, by convening better evidence, providing information on emerging hotspots and supporting policymakers to maximise the efficiency of clean energy innovation policy and programmes. The innovation platform will build upon the successes of the first phase of mission innovation, continuing enhancing those activities that members have found most valuable. The innovation platform is a key element of MI 2.0 and it will build upon the, the considerable work that has been done through the tracking progress work stream in the first phase. It's been designed according to two, two key principles, broad access to allow all members to propose, lead and participate in the development of collaborative activities and contribute based on interest and needs and flexibility. So it's a framework that can evolve over time, ensuring that the activities always reflect innovation needs, members interests and resource availability. The aim of the platform activities um, 
the overall aim is to enhance global confidence in emerging clean energy solutions. And to do that, the innovation platform will support a suite of initiatives led by and open to all MI members. The initiatives will contribute to the three objectives of the innovation platform, and they're shown here. They are to provide access to robust insights to track innovation progress and inform most more effective decision making at national and international level. To catalyze collaboration by exchanging knowledge, identifying research and development needs and convening funders and to work with innovators and investors and end users to accelerate solutions towards the market. So we'll work in three main areas, insights, collaboration and acceleration. The focus today um, for, and for the discussion that will that uh, will follow shortly is the insights module. And here we will build upon the work that has been outlined today that's been undertaken by the JRC, by IA and IRENA. And that Jenny mentioned in terms of the country highlights that we produced every year, we've also produced an impact report on two occasions. So looking at the impact of mission innovation as a whole and its members activity. In the first phase, we focused on on inputs, so looking at the amount of investment and the number of collaborations that have been stimulated by Mission Innovation and that, that its members have undertaken. And what we hope to do in the, the second phase is to extend that to go on to look at the outputs, outcomes and impacts of, of, inv of inno innovation policy and strategy so that we can really help policymakers I expect um, we will get some really useful insights from the discussion today that will help to shape the insights module over the coming months. Um, the, the insights will inform that development, so we're at the, at the stage of developing the module at present, so we're really keen to hear from the, the roundtable speakers and any insights from the floor as to how best to shape the insights module to make it as useful as possible to um, policymakers and stakeholders around the world. Over back to you, Ingrida. Thanks a lot, um, Helen. Um, uh, now um, this leads to this to the roundtable, and um, I would like to introduce uh, Statis Peteves, who will moderate this discussion. Uh, Statis is the head of the Knowledge for the Energy Union at the European Commission's Joint Research Center. Uh, Statis, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ingrida. Uh, do we have the whole panel? I see Martina, I see Per, Heike Ali, Abush, and Wendy. Okay, very good. Yes. Now, Wendy, you're uh, very low in my mosaic, but it doesn't matter. Now I see you. Well, delighted to be with you this afternoon. Uh, I would rather be in Santiago rather than this spring missing Europe of this year. We didn't have spring yet. I don't know in your places, but we suffered. Um, we, uh, some practicalities, uh, with all the respect, I will be introducing you, but I will be calling you with your first names. We have very little time because the presenters were so excited and enthusiastic, they shoot up 20 minutes. And this is a recorded session, so we have to wrap it up in time. Uh, should there be any time left, we may go an additional round of questions. But what I plan, I have one question, but please free to reflect on a point that triggered your attention either to what Ellen just said. You know, we're talking about the insights module. We have the bones in place, but we don't have yet fully the flesh. So we're looking your ideas, your suggestions, your comments, and or on the approaches that were developed and still pursued due the first phase, the tracking progress of the MI. Uh, then without anything else, I would appreciate if you keep your videos on during the 
discussion of the round table. I will start with the ladies first, or at least one lady first. I will start with you, Kelly. I was looking back at your article, Mission Innovation is Mission Critical. Excellent title. And then you went about analyzing commitments, progress, and you provided recommendations. We are now four or five years on the road. And we're very excited, and very excited that everyone is committed, that we have U.S. back fully committed in the process. And you heard what happened in the piloting, let me call it piloting phase of tracking progress, but now we move seriously with the insights module at the innovation platform in the second phase. What are your key suggestions about uh, regarding work on indicators? So please don't increase the number mentioned by Martina, 30 or 50. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I have three main categories of suggestions going forward. The first is um, taking advantage of all the progress that's been made. We need to still fill many gaps. So this is my first suggestion, fill the gaps. Uh, our biggest gaps uh, are around efficiency. Um, one big area that is very important for net zero, though it may be out of scope for mission innovation that I wanted to put on the table, was the agriculture and land use related technologies, which are so important to, to many countries, especially developing countries. Um, and then, of course, we still have some countries missing data altogether or where those countries have really substantial gaps. Um, and so I think it's very important to continue the work between the IEA and these countries um, and mission innovation to address the gaps. My second point is that uh, despite the wonderful presentation we heard on the private sector, um, we really we really still have very poor understanding of private sector trends. Um, I think the data remain largely estimated and very hard for me at least to trust and believe. Um, and this is important for governments because it remains unclear how much redundancy and duplication there is in, in public investments using scarce tax dollars um, and whether the, the government is taking enough risk in its investments. Um, and so if we don't have a better understanding of what's happening in the private sector, we really won't get, um, uh, we won't be able to target public dollars or euros or whatever uh, more effectively. And finally, I think another big area that, that we in our research group have just recently realized is very important is clarifying the investments of state-owned enterprises versus sort of government um, institutions. Um, I think it's really quite material in some countries what the state-owned enterprise investments are. And our data indicate uh, that SOEs um, are largely continuing to invest in a high carbon future um, and that they haven't begun to alter their um, investment patterns. And if that's true, they're working counter to all of the efforts of mission innovation. Um, and so I think we need to make sure when we think about public investments, um, we're asking very explicitly about state-owned enterprise investments as well. So with those three ideas on the table, I'll turn the floor back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, sincere apologies, I got very informal. I didn't even introduce you. So, apologies for that. Uh, Kelly, she is the Academic Dean and Professor of Energy at, at Environmental Policy at Tufts University. Now, let me pick it up from where uh, she noted missing data for developing 
countries or some members, semi members, and then the gaps with agriculture at land use. And I'm turning to you, uh, Abus, Abus Agar, founding head and professor of policy studies, School of Public Policy, the Indian Institute of Technology in New Delhi. You also have done, I mean, if we look at the literature, uh, your work step goes back into the early 2000s, looking at innovation policy and strategies about it. And when I started working on this subject matter uh, in the unit a decade ago, I always got confused because I, I said, look, you know, you start an R&D process. It takes awfully long to have a technology in the market, well past 10 years. And then you are asked to justify the expenditure as delivering the goods. And not only delivering the goods, but serving the policy. In particular case, at that time, the energy policy. So in your view, how do we go about, you know, being patient with the goods, seeing the goods of our investments? And this in particular with emerging economies that some are lagging behind in technology developments vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, other economies. Thank you, Bush. Um, thank you. That's not an easy question at all. Uh, but let me let me let me take a crack at that. You know, uh, I mean, I think somebody was talking earlier about uh, you know the role of data in in driving policy, and I think that's uh, it's absolutely key actually uh, in my mind, because you know it, I, I was thinking about you know that there's there's a saying that's been going around right now saying in the context of big data, that data is a new oil, right? But data has always been the oil for policy studies, right? And in the absence of data, you can't put together evidence that actually is going to persuade policymakers that these kind of investments of the kind you're talking about are, are actually delivering, delivering the goods, as you said. Now, it's true that, uh, that it's difficult to make a kind of a one-to-one -one a relationship between a particular kind of an R and D investment and a particular kind of a uh, particular kind of outcome, but one can do kind of portfolio analyses to say, okay, this was, and in, in fact, there have been some studies in the U.S. Uh, for many years ago. The National Academies did this kind of very interesting study where they looked at total energy efficiency uh, investments over over a term, of, over a, over a significant amount of time, and said, okay, how do we think? in shifts in products over time and and you're able to at least get some understanding of that a portfolio of investments led to a particular set of outcomes so you can't do a simple one to one correlation but but you can do analysis that help you get insights into overall investments and overall improvements having said that i think it's absolutely critical that uh, or and and potentially very useful for mission innovation to really start focusing on on promoting these kinds of analyses within MI member countries and potentially even to have a track on uh, innovation analysis as part of MI's own agenda such that one is able to do these kind of analyses across different countries and then be able to compare across countries to understand this relationship between R&D inputs and outcomes of the one, the kinds that policymakers want and understand how the kinds of policies and institutions in different countries are able to lead to different kinds of relationships between inputs and outcomes. And I think that kind of mutual both analysis within countries will be very helpful, uh, especially in, I think, many emerging economies where we do not have that kind of um, a, a deep track record of that kind of analysis. Uh, so I think it will also help build a culture of analysis, but also 
if one thinks of this kind of analytical effort as part of MI, um, the MI uh, work stream across countries, I think that also helps allow for comparative analysis, learning across countries about best practices, but also building communities of practice. And I think to me that is, it's probably a very small investment compared to the total amount of R&D &D investments that these countries are doing. But I think it'll be greatly beneficial because if one can actually change the input out outcome ratio, so to speak, you can get much greater bang for the buck. And if so, a very small investment in doing these kind of analyses, I think may help greatly increase the outcomes one is getting from the investments and therefore uh, I think really kind of advance the innovation agenda uh, and also at the same time help make a case of how to what level of investments to make and how to best make those investments in in RD and D. Thank you, Bruce. Um, by the way, Ingrida or Daniele, if we are approaching time, please shout. Uh, okay, status. Okay, very good. Thank you. Let me move now to my partners, the Dream Team, uh, Commission Chair CIA. At Irina in the first phase. We did what we did. You presented. They heard where we're convincing that we progressed. And let me turn to you, Per. Uh, how in the second phase, or as we will move on, do you think IA could help to enhance, so to speak? you know, the design of the module. And if we would meet again in a couple of years time, how could we demonstrate that we succeeded? How will we convince Kelly that we advanced? No, that's a, that's a very good question. And hi, everyone. Uh, uh, it's good to be on the panel. So thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, well, a few things. Uh, first of all, of course, uh, to build upon the first phase, uh, that's a simple answer. So there's a lot of experience that we can draw from. And a second thing, of course, uh, partly linked to that is the community that we are developing now. There is, a, of course, a new opportunity uh, with this very strong political push uh, on uh, net zero emissions, on accelerating clean energy transitions. We have COP26. So there is a, it's a high level of demand uh, for uh, more insights. And here I think as well, this is not for us to uh, is, is to continue working on actually this community of uh, that we have developed during the first phase and uh, getting better together. And I think this is coming back to one of the points made uh, by Kelly as well, that um, there are several gaps and uh, both when it comes to, to data, but also to uh, the challenge of collecting data. And I think here, uh, we we are better together. So that's another thing which, of course, is a, an input to uh, what could bring us to success. Uh, for the insight module, uh, again, the IA is a very strong supporter to continue leading the activities on public R&D data. Besides that, we're happy also to contribute with other aspects, uh, looking at patents, uh, which maybe don't we don't need the data from governments, but rather find it elsewhere on patents, on startups. And these uh, insights can also bring be brought into this uh, conversation. A uh, big challenge, and maybe that comes to my uh, my last point of maybe starting small, uh, not start status quo, but making sure that we don't build something which in the end is too much information. So we start with the things that we know that governments are uh, uh, demanding uh, and will be used. And I think this is the the the. The interesting task here, how do we make sure that the information we do provide through the insight module is then also of relevance and use for, for the users here has been expressed before as well. And that's in this case will be all those policy officers uh, around the world that are now trying to figure out how to put policies together to drive innovation. Uh, I think that's my, my input, uh, but happy, of course, to come back to any of these points. Thank you, Bear. Martina. The, the collaborative work with us at the UK uh, has reached a point that uh, it's very, very exciting uh, 
the the way you approached it, what would you have developed methodology wise in assessing and demonstrating aspects uh, that deemed as outcomes and impacts of uh, an innovation policy at investments, but uh, it was done, let me call it mainstream easy technologies. Now, if we move to portfolio uh, that the MAI is targeting, that you get cross-cutting cross at systemic technologies, let's name it digitalization and so on, then things become more complex. So what are you know, the lessons that you learn from the pilot, which by all means is very good, but please don't increase the number of indicators. You know, data is the oil, but I think we're getting a bit spoiled with the use of data. And then if we get stuck, we claim gaps in data and our brain stops thinking. So going back, you know, what are the lessons learned and how would you like to take it further? Thank you very much for the question. And uh, it kind of helps me elaborate on the points uh, I touch upon my presentation and the number of uh, indicators. So there are a couple of things we learned. We know, but we kind of also confirmed uh, by doing it. So one was that innovation is different from just invention. When we look on the whole innovation chain, innovation is a much complex uh, ecosystem which covers research, but also uh, learning by doing and uh, and commercialization. And therefore, we look at different indicators because each of them tell us the different part of the story. And also, not one indicator is enough to measure and provide this uh, reliable insight into the impact of the of the work. That's why we look on on the range of indicators. We look on mostly those which have already available in-house or which we covered by the by the, the project with you. Um, but so we, we saw, we wanted to, to, to map it along the innovation chain. For example, uh, while scientific publication and patent data told us a lot about invention activity, then the development and adoption of, uh, of uh, international standards then gave us indication of the market readiness and uh, near scale up in uh, in global internet in uh, in global deployment of the technology so so that's why the whole scale and how we want to ensure the further work so to enable that it is important to continue deepening and and uh, the data sets uh, just to be able to map all the changes not just breakthrough but also uh, incremental changes uh, because they we saw that they really uh, help to to uh, they, they help to diversify geographically the, the deployment of uh, technology and then also concerning the use of indicators in enhancing the the design of policy instruments to foster innovation a quick question is to is to identify a causation um, a policy that has actually resulted in innovation in one technology area and uh, that we learned that it's well Everybody knows it's it's super challenging and, and difficult, but what we are trying to little bit uh, see the correlation between different indicators. So uh, across uh, categories, so what we are doing, we are trying to, to link them and uh, and understand the outcomes by understanding the relationship a little bit in a, in a greater detail. So we look on how mutually uh, in uh, the indicators are mutually influ influencing each other, the strengths and also the direction of this influence. And uh, this is kind of the focus what we are doing now. And uh, in addition to that, we're also trying to look what I little bit touch upon in uh, in one of my slides, look not just on economics, uh, but also like a broader context such as uh, Carbon markets, whether they had any impact on some of the of the activity. So this is this is for our uh, lessons learned and future work. So we will continue working with uh, partners, uh, with Commission and so on, in further developing this work. We support the insights module, which try to have this uh, part of impact. We are we are planning the next phase with them, with the Mission Innovation Secretariat, and and we look forward to to really working on that and and learning from others uh, how we can make it better, more streamlined, more easier. Uh, and uh, F1 added off an added value for policymakers. Thank you.
Indeed, learning from others, uh, building capacities, as a Bush said, uh, demonstrating the value of the insights module to the members. Uh, therefore, by demonstrating the value, incentivize them to come along. If they don't come along, you will continue searching for those missing data, and you will be wondering about any gaps that may be there. Which then makes me to coming to you, Wendy. Uh, Wendy is senior policy advisor with the NRC, Canada. Uh, uh, Canada has been very supporting in the first phase of the tracking progress, the, you know, the pilot or the work stream. It also has been working with us, the Secretariat, in uh, debating and uh, drafting the ideas for the Insights module, the innovation platform. Wendy, what would you like to see concretely out of, in terms of indicators, metrics, out of the Insights module? Do we have Wendy with us? Sorry, Status. I think that we have just lost Wendy for some reason. Um, don't see her anymore. In okay, the in the interest of time, let's not Wendy, wait for Wendy. I'm sorry for that. Quickly go. Can I quickly go one more round? At least through Kelly at a bush. And then if Wendy comes, then we pick up Wendy again. How are we doing time-wise? Eight minutes. Eight minutes with closing. Kelly, quickly. Which question did you want me to answer? What? Think of one. <laughs> I'm sure you want to say many things. <laughs> Well, I, I actually, I'd like to come back to Amba. Why just we need to know, let, let me go back. You said, you know, it's nice to know private. We will never sort it out. So why should we continue trying to get right the decimal point on private investments? Does it matter? I I actually think we, we could get it right if we really tried. I. I think there's been a lot of progress in Europe on this question and almost no progress in other countries. And so I do think Europe has demonstrated that we can um, learn a lot more about what, what the private sector is doing. And, and I'm arguing that that should be a focus for the next phase and relatedly because we don't know whether to consider the state-owned enterprises public or private, um, I really do think we need to focus seriously on the state-owned enterprises because in many developing countries, the state-owned enterprise R&D &D investments may be much larger than um, public investments uh, overall. And so we need to make sure that those investments are going in the same direction and are not working a counter purpose uh, to the, the goals of mission innovation. Thank you. Wendy, uh, are you with us now? I guess so. I am. I managed to reconnect. Thanks. I apologize. Uh, we're sorry for that. <laughs> Did you hear uh, me about praising you? in your involvement in the tracking progress or commitment, engagement, and support. And now in this phase, uh, in short, I was going to ask you at least which sort of indicators would you expect from the Insights module? So Canada is happy and engaged. Sure. Thanks. Thanks so much. And I think, you know, watching these presentations today and I think during the earlier modules, 
uh, with tracking progress, looking at patents. I think all of those things are covering some of the things we really hope to be able to see continuing moving forward. I think in some cases for us, when we're looking at this also from a design perspective and like how are we going to use this information to inform sort of new policies and programs in addition to tracking progress, I think it's really framing things around, you know, sort of this idea of insight. So how can we use all of the indicators that we have, you know, ones that we've already gone through, things like tracking both the public and private funding, tracking some of our early, you know, outputs and activities, as well as moving towards those like outcomes that uh, Martina was speaking about. I think for us, it's making sure that we're framing those uh, and sort of analyzing those and getting some meaningful insights. So for us, I think tracking things in terms of clear clear frameworks. So for example, with NRCAN, we're trying to look at things through, for example, the lens of, you know, the IEA um, analysis of, um, you know, sort of looking at clean energy technology guides so that we can actually cut the data in ways that actually allow us to drill down to see where are we and where do we need to be uh, when we're actually looking at you know, our investments in patents, our activities and so forth, so that we have enough flexibility to be able to drill down and really analyze our indicators and our results. Um, so looking at things we said with patents or early knowledge that we're generating, I'd love to be able to see us too, to be able to at some point start to integrate some early indicators of knowledge diffusion as well. So where possible, if we're able to even look at things like patent citations, where we're able to look at tech scans to look at early indicators of adoption and use of new new patents, new science that's coming out. Um, and things like, you know, the framework that I think, um, I, I keep referring to IEA, but the framework that IEA has put in place for looking at indicators of, you know, for, for policy use um, of innovation uh, research, I think, you know, potentially using a selection of some of those indicators would be really helpful for us because we could select them from each of those kind of four modules around, you know, producing knowledge about how we manage information and looking at how that moves into sort of our market formation. So we're able to look at different stages along sort of the innovation continuum to see where we may actually be having uh, progress and making an impact. Um, but I think, you know, we don't necessarily want to get lost in trying to come up with, you know, too many indicators, right? Because I think sometimes we get lost in the trap of trying to let the indicators do the thinking for us. And, uh, you know, really, we need to use that to be able to do the, the thoughtful analysis, I think, that we need to identify sort of, you know, where we are and where we need to go. So, um, with that, I think um, sort of indicators that have already been framed out by some of our presenters will be quite useful. Um, but I think for us, it really is around sort of that indicators plus analysis and using those to really map um, our current activities so we can frame sort of our next steps and then we can use those to benchmark where we're, we're moving forward in relation to uh, some of those pre-existing like technological frameworks that we have. Thank you very much, Wendy. I wish we had more time to go on, but I don't think we have the time. Ingrida? Um, we have uh, seven minutes status to just wrap up everything, if that's okay. Okay, I need a couple to, to say, so I'll give the floor to Abush. If you would like to continue your thoughts, Abush, what should we do? In the insights module, at least to advance, you know, from the first phase? What additional things that you know, are I, doable? I, I, I want to just kind of reiterate the point I made earlier. I think, uh, I know there's a lot of focus on data and indicators and all of that, and that's all very important. But I, I think the real insights, if one wants, for innovation come from really kind of unpacking the black box of innovation. You know, what's actually going on, for example, within firms? right, or within academic institutions, or in the relationship between academic institution and firms. Because I think that's where the nitty gritty of innovation is. And while all the, the data and the indicators all give us snapshots, in the end, they, they don't give us insights into the dynamics of the innovation process. And I think, to my mind, uh, I, I think that is the kind of insight that really will help us understand how to organize ourselves better so that all the money that we're putting in actually gets us better, much faster, 
to the place we'd like to go. So I, I think I want to just kind of reemphasize that, that there, that that complementary kind of work stream, you know, I, I think this data, et cetera, is absolutely important. I mean, I myself have been using IA data for 25 years in understanding patterns and trying to understand, you know, what global shifts are and all of that. Extremely useful. These indicators, extremely useful. But in the end, really, as I said, unpacking the black box, understanding the dynamics of what's going on, how things are varying across sectors, across countries, how we're organizing organizing ourselves in order to really move this process. I mean, I'll just take a second to say, you know, even this notion of what is an energy technology? I mean, we've been talking about this for 20 years. It's not that you can easily define what an energy technology is. A new piece of machine learning, is that an energy technology? Actually, I think it's going to be extremely powerful in helping us understand uh, patterns of performance, but it's come out of completely a different arena. So I think we've got to be a little bit careful not to get too hung up on thinking narrowly about energy technology, but really begin to say, okay, what are the kinds of knowledges and technologies that are actually driving the shifts? And begin to understand those kind of relationships and dynamics. I think that's absolutely key, especially if we are thinking about a longer time frame. You know, we're we're talking about putting in place a knowledge base that helps us make decisions for the coming years and decades to come. So I'll just I'll I'll just maybe just stop with that kind of thought there. You better indeed. I'm glad you stopped because you started making me uncomfortable going back to elements of understandings that you know move away from the stereotype of the thinking of the structure of the uh, insights module uh, the i have to conclude colleagues is um, it's very bad but let's blame it to the presenters and if there is a noise, by the way, is thundering outside. So confirming what I said to you earlier about a year with missing spring in Europe, maybe it's coming later. So uh, we all agree that the task is very challenging. But the task, the way it's been designed up to now, and I think Ellen made that point, is not prescriptive or ultra descriptive is they it has some elements that we need more to discover as we go on and as you incentivize the membership the membership of the mi to come along offer things and collectively go about you know comparing practices and building capacities as i both said now am i optimistic uh, personally, I am because the first uh, five years, you know, with the tracking progress, two and a half years, a lot has been done and a lot has been learned. And I think that was demonstrated by the presentations. And I'm sure you will discover more when you go back to the presentations after this workshop. Now, another thing that makes me optimistic is that. Uh, we, the Commission, are committed to this process. Uh, we decided to contribute considerable resource to experiment with it and try to see whether or not we can move it to a higher level. And definitely, I hope that uh, my partners in the first phase IEA at IRENA will, will come along and continue supporting these efforts because they have a lot to offer. Now, what is important, though, is that we bring in into the process more the other MI members, because there are many MI members, they have their own capacities, they have their own practices, they have their own ideas and views, how they value benchmark and design, you know, programs and their policies. And this is the key to happen and I hope it will happen. Now, the only thing I can promise to you is 
to have a workshop in a year or two years time in which hopefully we will be able to showcase more of what we did today from the first phase. Now, in closing, I would like to thank all the participants, especially the presenters and you, the panelists. I very much wish that we had more time. Hopefully, there will be other opportunities in the near future. And most important, the MI Secretariat, I don't know if Jenny is still with us, or Ellen, my colleague Daniele at Ingrida for organizing this event. And don't forget that I hope that we see each other next week during the ministerial event. Ingrid, back to you. Okay, some information. Yes, about thanks, Status. Um, I believe I'm sharing my slides now. Um, yeah, so I just want to also add the last thank you from our side to the roundtable panelists, participants and all the presenters. Um, and yeah, thanks for joining us in this ministerial side event today. Uh, in case you have any questions, uh, please do not hesitate to contact us uh, using one of these um, emails as shown. Uh, also, here are the tracking progress and ministerial websites uh, for more information. And um, yeah, thanks again, and I hope to see you all in the future Mission Innovation events. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs> bye, thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Oh.